All right, so what have we looked at so far? We've tried to understand the two basic parts or two you know, main divisions in an argument, and that's the premises and the conclusion. Uh, we've taken a look at terms. Terms are not what is true or false. Right? Terms are either defined or undefined, and that happens by either following the rules or not. <laughs> I mean, he looked at several different kinds of definitions. Uh, we've uh, looked at propositions, atomic propositions, and propositions are what is true or false. Right? Propositions are what is true or false. And whether an atomic proposition is true or false is going to be determined by the, uh, how uh, the terms relate to each other within the atomic proposition. You know, atomic propositions are composed of terms. Now, we didn't dive too much into that, but yeah, you know, we're taking kind of a pretty basic approach. So I have a term tree and I have a term tall, and therefore uh, the tree is tall. That proposition is true. Uh, the tree is fluffy. That proposition is false. <clears throat> um, so that's our real <laughs> naive version <laughs> of the truth or error of atomic propositions. We've also looked at truth relations, and these are the relationships, the truth relationships between atomic propositions. Uh, how the truth or error of one proposition can affect another. Okay. And these truth relationships, in turn, uh, are expressed by logical connectives and complex propositions. And complex propositions express these truth relationships between propositions. And the parts of a complex proposition can either be atomic propositions or even other complex propositions. So complex proposition gets even bigger with more <laughs> complex propositions composing it. Um, you know, last time we looked at the connectives that we use to understand, or to, I'm sorry, to express these truth uh, relations and these uh, propositions. Uh, with this chapter, we're, we're going to learn how to construct truth tables. Now, truth tables will give us uh, every possible truth value of complex propositions. And it does this by first starting with every possible combination of truth values for the atomic propositions. This is going to be very important later on in the next chapter when we start evaluating arguments. When we start looking at every possible truth value of the premises compared to every possible truth value of the conclusion. Now, before you get too intimidated by this phrase, every possible truth value, it's really not <laughs> that complicated. Uh, we're going to have a set of rules that's going to give us uh, a, a very fine set of finite steps to construct our truth tables. And while the truth table can get big, right, each step is not um, insurmountable. I just need to follow the steps. Just need to follow the steps. Now, like I said, these uh, truth tables are going to give us every possible combination of truth values and uh, every possible uh, truth value for the complex propositions, you know, given the uh, truth relationships expressed right, between the component propositions. Don't underestimate the value of this tool. I. Uh, we can literally begin to understand at least one way to understand at least one kind of infinite using just these very simple steps, just these very simple steps. And, and, and all in all, it's going to tell us, it's going to give us a series of steps, which, which will in turn <laughs> help us to evaluate every possible deductive argument every possible deductive argument. That's huge. Before we dive into the truth tables very much, I thought it might be helpful to go over a few practice exercises involving uh, 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 which you know kind of proposition we're dealing with, uh, just looking at, just using the parentheses and the logical connectives. So here's uh, an example of, a, of a, an exercise we're going to have here. We're looking for what kind of complex proposition is this? So notice we've got parentheses and we've got logical connectives. Well, the way to do this is to look for what's you know outside the parentheses, right? So inside the parentheses, uh, that's a conditional. Right? But the overall proposition is not a conditional. When you look outside the parentheses, 
the overall proposition, the overall complex proposition we have here is a conjunction. Now it's a, con a conjunction where one of the conjuncts is a conditional, but overall this is a conjunction. This is a conjunction. So looking at this one, uh, notice we've got lots of connectives in here. We've got conditionals and negations, and we've got parentheses. So uh, take a look at what's outside the parentheses. Right? Look at what's outside the parentheses. Well, that, that's a conditional there. Now the consequent of this conditional is also a conditional, and it's a conditional of negations. That's in the consequent, and the antecedent of this conditional, <laughs> it's a lot to say here, isn't it? The antecedent of this conditional is also a conditional, uh, just P Q, but overall, all right, this is this is a conditional, and we find that by looking for what's outside the parentheses. Let's take a look at this one. Now we have uh, conditional and negations. Well, again, I'm telling you, look for what's outside the parentheses. Right? Outside the parentheses. And we have a conditional of negations within the parentheses, but outside we just have a negation. Now this is an instance, I don't think you've seen it before, but this is an instance where the entire complex proposition is just negated. And the entire complex proposition is just negated. So this is a negation. Now this one's probably, wow, look at that. Got a lot of symbols happening. Got parentheses, and disjunction, and negations. But again, look for what's outside the parentheses. And what's outside the parentheses is also a negation. Okay? This is a negation. All right, so uh, just keep that in mind for when I'm talking about uh, complex propositions here on out and the truth conditions for these complex propositions. Well, if we're going to understand the infinite, we got to start small. We start small with atomic propositions. So if you remember, atomic propositions, the truth value of atomic proposition is just determined by the uh, terms that are used to, you know, combined into the atomic proposition. So the tree is tall, is true. The tree is fluffy, is not true. <laughs> Complex propositions are different. Complex propositions are not determine the tr sorry the truth value of complex propositions is not determined solely by the meanings of the terms rather you know, the largest chunk of this work is, is done with the truth values of the atomic propositions okay so uh, when we're constructing our truth tables we have to have enough rows for all the possible combinations of the truth values of the component atomic propositions so this sounds really complicated it's not. <laughs> uh, there's a very simple formula which determines the number of rows for our truth table. Yeah. <clears throat> the top row is always going to contain the, the values, I'm uh, sorry, the, uh, the letters representing the atomic propositions, and it's going to have the formula for the propositions. You know, for the, and then later on when we get to the arguments, it'll have the uh, formula for the uh, premises and the conclusion. But after that, it's just the number of rows for every possible combination of atomic propositions. And that is determined by the number of variables right, raised, uh, sorry, the, the number two, <laughs> raised to the power of the number of uh, atomic propositions. All right. So uh, this is rule five right, for our truth tables. Uh, the number of rows, rule five, total in this whole logic course, but it applies specifically to propositions. Um, the number of rows in a truth table is equal to two times the power of the number of variables or the number of letters used in that uh, particular uh, argument. So uh, if we have an argument with uh, P and Q, that's two that's two variables, so that's two to the power of two, which, you know, you don't have to have a calculator after this one. That's uh, simply four, <laughs> four. Uh, if we have three variables, P, Q, and R, that is two, that, you know, so that's three variables, so that's two to the power of three, which is eight rows. If we have uh, P, Q, R, and S, that's four variables, so now that's two to the power of four, <laughs> uh, which is now 16. 
<clears throat> so like I said, it's not complicated. Right? It's not complicated. And uh, um, I've provided a little chart for you, <laughs> a little table in, in the text, which gives you the number of you know, variables and consequently the number of rows that's available. And uh, it, you know, it, it adds up pretty quick. Now, I really seriously doubt we're going to have, I think one of them is over a thousand rows. We're probably not going to have a truth table like that. Uh, but it, you know, it's, it's there nevertheless. <laughs> um, now, you know, when you're doing the homeworks or you're constructing these truth tables for your, for your own work, I strongly suggest using a spreadsheet. Right? So something like Numbers or Excel or Google Docs. Google Docs has a, a spreadsheet. You know, you can go to Google Docs and, and start constructing spreadsheets there. And then just make your, you know, make a, 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 a table, right, uh, with P and Q and have your four rows. And then make another one with P, Q, and R, have your eight rows. And P, Q, R, S, have your 16 rows. And P, Q, R, S, T. Right? Keep going and going and going. Um, at least up to, you know, four or five variables or right? something like that. So you, just so you have enough uh, that are there. And then when it comes time to construct a new truth table, like you copy and paste that. <laughs> um, but you, know, you could do it however you like, just as so long as you make sure you follow uh, this fifth rule, right? this fifth rule. So that's rule five. The number of rows in the truth table is equal to two times the number of variables used in the formula. Okay, so the number of rows is one thing, and it's not hard to calculate the number of rows. Well, the next step is to assign every possible combination of truth values for all of the atomic propositions. Now, don't don't worry. <laughs> you don't actually have to get creative here and you know kind of make a checklist. No, no, it's actually pretty straightforward. <coughs> um, however, explaining it verbally, is a lot more difficult than, say, just showing it to you. So uh, take a look at this. Here's how we assign every possible combination of truth assignments for the variables. And, and again, don't freak out. This is not nearly as complicated as it first seems. So uh, the first thing you do, right, following rule five, we've got two variables. So we'll try this example of P and Q. We've got our two variables. That means we've got our four rows. Well, um, we place you know, P and Q, we have, our, we have our four rows, we place P and Q and the columns. The next step is we take half of the rows of P and assign them as true, the top half, and then the bottom half receive the value F for false. Uh, so that, you know, there we go, there's our possible combinations for uh, 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 P. Q, it, it works kind of the same way, except we don't start with the total number of rows for Q. Instead, we just start with the rows that are labeled as T for P, right, the true for P. And we take that, you know, that, that that's our first you know, set that we're dealing with. And we take the top half of that for Q and assign them as T and the bottom half as, as false. And then we just copy and paste for uh, the rest of the rows below that. Now, that may not have been too clear with just P and Q, right? When we deal with uh, uh, when we're dealing with these assignments, so let, let's try with you know P, Q, and R. So following rule five, we have our three variables P, Q, and R. That's two raised to the power of three. That's eight rows. So we have P, Q, and R in our columns, and we put uh, at the top of our columns, and we have rows one through eight. So first things first, we take the top half of P, and we assign them all as true. So that's rows one through four, and we take the bottom half of P. That's five through five through eight. And we assign them uh, false. Next step, we go move over to Q, but we're not going to assign the first four rows of Q as true. Right? Instead, we're we're only going to deal with you know just, just at the time right deal only with the true rows you know, the rows labeled true for P. All right, and the top half of those right so that's rows run through four. The top half of those receive true for Q. And the bottom half receive false for p uh, false for q, and then we just copy and paste all the way down. And you know by the time we you know, the last column should always be true false true false. <laughs> it doesn't matter how many variables you have. The last column should always be true false true false. So uh, you know that's we have our you know true false, and then we just copy and paste all the way down. If we had another 
of rho, say we had PQRS, right? R would not be true, false, true, false. Instead, R would have the would look actually a lot like Q does in this one. So that's how you uh, you, you do rule six. You assign right P, you know, the top half of P receives true, the bottom half receives F, and you move to Q. You deal only with that, you know, those rows labeled true for P. The top half of those receive true for Q. The bottom half receive F. Then you copy and paste all the way down. You move to R. You deal only with those rows labeled true for Q. The top half of those get T, get true. The bottom half get false. And you just copy and paste all the way down. And so on and so forth for if you have S or T or U or, or whatever. So if you look in the text, you notice that I have given you uh, examples of this. I think I did it through T. Uh, might have just been through S, but I uh, did it through T. So you, you, know, you, you could just take those and uh, put them in a spreadsheet for safekeeping. So you can see, I'm just going to show you here real quick. You can see uh, what's happening. So if I have P, Q, R, and S, the top half of P, that's rows 1 through 8, they receive the value of true. The bottom half, that's 9 through 16, they receive the value of false. So I move on to Q. And Q, we're only going to deal with those rows labeled as true for P first. Okay? So you can see the, that's rows 1 through 8. Well, the top half of those, that's rows 1 through 4, is given true for Q. And the bottom half, that's rows 5 through 8, is given false for Q. And then we just copy and paste for the rest of that column all the way down. We look at R. And R, we're only going to deal with those rows labeled as true for Q first. That's rows 1 through 4. The top half of those, right, that's rows 1 and 2, receive true for R. And then uh, the bottom half, that's three rows 3 and 4 for R, receive false. And you copy and paste all the way down. And then the last column just gets uh, true, false. And that's true, false all the way down. Okay, that's rule 6. All right. Assign every possible combination of truth values uh, for the atomic propositions. All right. Uh, so now... Oh, and if you notice, <laughs> when, it, when you go in the text, uh, you can see that I've provided the truth tables for some of the, like four or five values. I forget what off the top of my head. Uh, you know, you might just do yourself a favor again. Use a spreadsheet and uh, construct a truth table or, you know, construct a, you know, put a table in there and, you know, leave the rest blank, of course. But put a table in there or at the very least just something where you can... Uh, you know, put all those truth assignments in there, following the rules five, uh, six, uh, and just copy and paste later on, right? That, that'll save yourself a lot of time if you just go ahead and do that. And yet again, uh, you can see, <laughs> you can see that I've done a lot of that work for you. You just kind of have to copy it out of the text. Keep in mind that the numbers are row, uh, the, the rows are numbered, right? and they're numbered for a reason, right? A lot of the homework will rely upon you finding which row has some particular truth assignment. So uh, make sure you, uh, when you construct your truth tables, you're going to have to use the numbers as well, not just the, uh, the propositions and the uh, truth values, but also number the rows. Um, otherwise, you're not going to be able to do a, a fair amount of the homework, at least not very well. <laughs> um, so we've got rule five. Produce the number, you know, have the number rows equal to two times raised to the power of the number of variables. Row uh, rule six assigned every possible combination of truth values, and we got that. Well, the next step is is rule seven. Okay. So we've got the combinations of the uh, uh, possible truth values. Well, we have to keep that same combination consistent through the rest of the table. So with rule seven, you know, when you have your formula written out at the top, and you'll see an example of that in just a second. When you have your, your formula up there, uh, you, know, you copy, again, put this in a spreadsheet. It'll make your life easier. Copy the column right with this uh, truth assignments for P, and then everywhere else you see P in that truth table, paste P. Okay. Copy Q, the column for Q, and everywhere else you see a Q in that uh, uh, truth table, paste Q, right? and just keep going on down that way, right? construct it that way. Uh, and uh, that'll, that'll save yourself a lot of time, a lot of time. So we got five, rule five, number of rows equal to two raised to the power of variables. Rule six, assign, um, uh, you know, assign every possible combination of truth values. I'm sure you had to do that. And rule seven, assign, those, assign the same 
uh, truth values for each variable as given in that, uh, as given, you know, later on in the argument, as given in that assignment. And the next thing we need to look at are the truth conditions for uh, all for the various complex propositions uh, that we've seen, uh, and you know, uh, uh, express that in the truth table. So I think I told you, I think I mentioned, the truth value of a complex proposition, which we're evaluating with these truth tables, the truth value of a complex proposition is determined by the truth value of its component propositions. So for the moment, let's just stick with atomic propositions, although keeping in mind we could be dealing with complex propositions. Uh, and let's start with negations. So uh, remember that a negation is the claim that some proposition is false. Right? So here's a proposition, atomic proposition. Uh, that tree is fluffy. That tree is fluffy. Well, obviously, that proposition is false. So the atomic proposition, that atomic proposition is false. <clears throat> if I were to construct a negation out of that, I would say it is false that that tree is fluffy. It is false that that tree is fluffy. All right. Now, that proposition, that negation, it's a complex proposition composed out of the atomic proposition and, and, and you know, the minus sign. That negation is true. The negation, it is false that the tree is fluffy, is true because the proposition, the tree is fluffy, is false. So this tells us <coughs> the truth conditions for a negation. A negation is true just in case a proposition, the, the proposition is false, the negated proposition is false, uh, and it is false otherwise. So here's another proposition. Uh, the tree is wooden. Right? The tree is wooden. That's an atomic proposition. And if I were to turn that into a negation, it is false that the tree is wooden. That negation would be false. Okay, so these are the truth conditions for a negation. A negation is true, just in case the component proposition is false. A negation is false, just in case the component proposition is true. Now this brings us to rule eight. In our truth tables, we will enclose the truth value of the complex proposition in parentheses. This is for the sake of being able to spot it quickly, and trust me, it's gonna make your life easier later on. Okay, let's ap apply rules five, six, seven, and eight uh, for negations and to look at the truth conditions for negation. So uh, just for this illustration, we're just gonna use uh, the atomic propositions, keeping in mind that complex propositions can also be negated, but you know, you know, one step at a time, right? <laughs> so rule five, uh, one of the few cases, we actually only have one variable. So the number of rows is two raised to the power of one. Well, that, that's just two. <laughs> so we have uh, our variable, we have our two rows, one and two, and we have our negation listed there in the columns as well. Notice that the negation symbol gets its own truth, it gets its own column for the truth assignment. That's because we are uh, looking at the truth value of the negation uh, as opposed to just the truth value of P. Right? So rule six, we assign every possible combination for our variables, well, in this case, it's just T and F. <laughs> uh, uh, so we put T and F in our column there for our, our truth assignment for P. Then we, following rule seven, we copy and paste those, those truth assignments over to P. All right, so then got T and F then in our column for P. And now this is where we have our new rule eight, enclose the truth values for the premise of the conclusion in parentheses, right? in parentheses. And uh, so this is what this looks like. So if we were to have, say, a series of propositions or more than one, uh, each proposition, uh, uh, each complex proposition would have, or you know, each proposition would have its truth assignment enclosed in parentheses. So in this case, you know, here we go. So notice, you know, P where its value is true, well, a negation with, with that truth value then is now false. 
And where P is false, then the truth value for the negation is true, following our truth conditions for negations. So next we have conjunctions. Now remember that a conjunction is the claim that both component propositions or both conjuncts are true. Right. So I'll uh, have a proposition say this, you know, this, let's say one of those trees back there. Right? <laughs> so uh, here's a, here's an uncommon proposition. The tree, the, uh, this organism is a tree. I uh, have another proposition. Uh, this organism is green. Okay, so if I can join those, this organism is a tree and this organism is, a, is green, right? I have a conjunction. And each of those propositions is true, or uh, both of them. <laughs> both of those propositions are true. This, uh, this organism is a tree is true, and this organism is green is true. Now, since I've conjoined those into a complex proposition and each of the conjuncts is true, the conjunction itself is true. Now, if one of the conjuncts is false, the conjunction is false. So if I say this organism is a tree, and I say this organism is blue, and I, I put that together, right? this organism is a tree and this organism is blue, that conjunction is false. Right? <clears throat> that conjunction is false. And it's certainly false when <laughs> both conjuncts are false. So uh, this organism is a mammal and this organism is singing opera, right? Uh, okay, right. Both uh, that conjunction is really, really false. So the conjunction, right? Conjunctions claim that the component, both of the component propositions are true, and a conjunction is true just in case both components are true, <laughs> and false when at least one of them is false. It's false when at least one of them is false. All right, this is what a truth table using conjunctions looks like. So first we follow rule five. We've got our two variables, P and Q. <coughs> um, so that's uh, two raised to the power of two, that's four rows. Uh, following rule six, we give our every possible combination of truth assignments. We've seen that now and done several times. Following rule seven, we place the same truth assignments for each variable within the rest of the truth table. So P receives, in, in, the, in the proposition P and Q, P receives the same truth assignment as we assigned back with rule six. Same thing with Q. Okay, so the next thing, uh, following rule eight, we enclose the truth value of the uh, complex proposition in parentheses uh, using our truth conditions for a conjunction. And remember, conjunction is true just in case both conjuncts are true. So that's only in row one, right? Only row one uh, is true for the uh, complex proposition of this conjunction. Uh, with row two, Q is false. With row three, P is false. And row four, both P and Q are false, right? Those conjuncts are false, or at least one of those conjuncts is false. So the entire complex proposition of this conjunction is uh, false. So we've got negations and conjunctions. Those are the easy ones. <laughs> Remember the rest of the complex propositions express a truth relation. So uh, next we have disjunctions. And remember that a disjunction uses an either or connective and expresses subcontrariety. Right? And when, what that means is, uh, you know, with subcontrariety, if one is false, then the other is true, right? Or at least one and so if one is false and the other is true, well, that means that at least one is true. And by the way, it's, it's possible that both are true. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's start off uh, with something like this. Okay, so either this here, either this, is, uh, either this organism is a tree or this organism is a bush. <clears throat> That's, that disjunction uh, is it, true. Right. Uh, the component propositions either uh, the component propositions are this organism is a tree, the other one is this organism is a vine, right. or oh, sorry, is a bush. Well, at least one of those is true. Right. If it's one's false, the other's true. Um, so a disjunction is true, just in case 
at least one disjunct is true. At least one disjunct is true. <clears throat> now, it's possible that both can be true, right? Uh, either this organism is a tree or this organism is tall. Right? Oh, okay, right? Both of those component propositions are true. And that's fine, right? Because the condition is still met. At least one is true. Uh, a, a disjunction is false only when, or just in case, the component disjuncts are both false. Both false. So either this organism is a bush or this organism is a vine, right? Well, those are both false. So that disjunction uh, is false. That disjunction is false. Okay. So a, you know, we had a, a negation, remember? Negation is true just in case the component proposition is false and false otherwise. You have a conjunction. A conjunction is true just in case both conjuncts are true and false when at least one conjunct is false. And now we have disjunction. Disjunction is true just in case at least one disjunct is true and false when both disjuncts are false. Well, that just leaves us with conditionals. Let's apply rules five through eight for our disjunctions. So first we have rule five, we've got our two variables, that's two raised to the power of two, four rows. We've got our P and Q following rule seven, we place our truth assignments in our columns for P, I'm no, sorry, following rule six, we place our truth assignments for P and Q in our columns. And then for rule seven, we paste those very, copy and paste those very same truth assignments to uh, the, every instance of the variables within our formula. Okay, now for rule eight, Following the truth uh, truth conditions for a disjunction, a disjunction is true just in case at least one of the disjuncts is true. So looking at row one, well, both of them are true, so at least one of them is true. Uh, so that uh, that row is, is assigned T, and following rule eight, uh, it's enclosed in parentheses. For rule, uh, uh, so for row two, P is true, so it's true. For row three, Q is true, so the disjunction is true. And it's only when we get to row four where both of the component disjuncts is false, so that's uh, when the disjunction is false. Well, conditionals might be the trickiest of the bunch to understand. Remember that a conditional expresses the truth relation of sufficiency from the antece antecedent to the consequent, right? Antecedent to the consequent. So uh, we use the connective if then. Uh, if, where did it go? There it is. <laughs> if this organism is a tree, then this organism is a plant, right? So that's true, right? And that's because the truth of that antecedent necessitates the truth of that consequent, right? This organism is a tree. If that's true, that means this organism is a plant. That, that follows. Okay. So uh, there's only one way that a conditional is false. Because remember, a conditional is supposed to express sufficiency. If the first is true, then the second is true. It's supposed to express su sufficiency. Uh, the only way that it's false is you know, if the antecedent is true, and the consequent is false, because then that means it's, it's not sufficient. Okay. If the antecedent is true, then the consequent is false. That's the only way a conditional is false. So I have uh, this organism is a tree. That's true. Uh, this organism is a mammal. So here's a proposition. If this organism is a tree, then this organism is a mammal. That's a false conditional. And the only way that a conditional can be false, I'm going to say this again. <laughs> the only way that a conditional can be false is if the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. Now, this has kind of a strange result. Because uh, that means that conditionals with false antecedents are always true. And at first, you might balk at this idea, like, what? No, that can't be right. Well, well think about it, right? Here, here's another conditional. Uh, with a true antecedent, I'm oh, sorry, a false antecedent, but a true consequent, right? If this organism is a vine, then this organism is a plant. Well, that, that's true, right? That, that conditional is true. Yet the antecedent is false because that organism is a tree. 
Here's, a, here's another conditional with a false antecedent and a false consequent. If this organism is a dog, then this organism is a mammal. That's also true, right? That's also true. So conditionals with false antecedents are always true, are always true. And it might seem bizarre, but keep in mind, the only way that a conditional is false is if it's actually not sufficient. And the only way it can be you know, not sufficient is if the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. Okay, so the truth conditions for a conditional. It's false when the antecedent is true and the consequent is false and true otherwise. And then otherwise means that whenever, an whenever you have a, a false antecedent or a true consequent, you have a true conditional. And I know that sounds bizarre, but you, you get used to it, trust me. You get used to it. So it's uh, conditional is false when the antecedent is true and the consequent is false, but true otherwise. And that just means a false antecedent or a true consequent. Okay. So that's the truth conditions for a conditional. Now that wraps up uh, you know, what I call just the real you know, basic uh, uh, connectives, right? We got negation, conjunction, disjunction, and conditional. But we still have two more truth relations, right? So, so we've got subcontrariety and sufficiency, but we have to cover yet contrariety and necessity. Let's take a look at conditionals using rules 5, 6, 7, and 8 with our truth table. So rule 5, pretty familiar with it by now. We've got two variables, so that's 2 to the power of 2, and that's four rows. And then we've got our P and Q at the top column. Those are our, uh, atomic propositions. And then our complex proposition listed after that with the conditional. So rule 6, uh, t we have every possible combination of truth assignments with the, our, our atomic propositions. Rule 7, we copy and paste those into every instance of the variable within the, prop the complex proposition listed afterwards. And now we have our truth conditions for rule 8. So row two, notice row two is the only row with uh, a true antecedent and a false consequent. So it is false. Uh, row one, we've got uh, a true consequent and a true antecedent. I mean, it, it's also true, but you know, keep in mind that since row two is the only one that's false, the other two rows, rows three and four, they are also listed as true. So one fast way you can do these truth tables is to simply just look for those rows with a false antecedent and you can automatically mark those rows as true. And then you look for the uh, rows with the true consequent and you can automatically mark that row as true. And there's, uh, uh, then you just find those, the, the rest of the rows should be true antecedents and false consequents. Uh, and that'll be you know, kind of a shortcut for these uh, truth tables. If you remember, what contrariety said is, you know, the truth of, of one proposition means the other is false. Uh, another way of expressing this is, at least one of these propositions is false. <laughs> at least one of the propositions is false. Now, the way that we express this is to use a disjunction of negations. Now, I, I want to give you a little word of warning here, right? So, to do this, we have to uh, have a disjunction where each disjunct is a negation. Right? So we have to uh, apply the truth conditions one at a time. <laughs> so in your uh, truth table, you will first, you know, you'll, you'll have the assignments for the atomic propositions, then you'll uh, have the, uh, you know, because you found the rules for a negation, then you have the rules for the negation. But then the truth value of that conjunction, since it is a, I'm sorry, that disjunction, since it is a disjunction overall, not a negation overall, a disjunction overall, then the truth value for that disjunction is determined by the negation, right? Not just the atomic proposition. So like I said, you can have complex propositions within complex propositions. It can get complicated pretty fast. Okay, so uh, that's our, that's contrariety or contrary uh, 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 contrary propositions, contrary truth value. It's a disjunction of negations. 
For necessity, remember necessity was that the error of one means another one is false. Right? False makes false. <laughs> Uh, and to express this, we still use a conditional, but the, but the antecedent and the consequent are both negated. So same thing. When you have it in your truth table, you have your assignments, right? Assignments of the truth values for atomic propositions, that's by rule six, and then you copy and paste those over to wherever the atomic propositions pop up in the uh, argument, that's by, by rule seven. But then you use the negation on it to, you know, to determine the truth value of that negation. And the truth value of the negations then determines the truth value of the conditional. So you, you follow, follow just step by step, right? And for both cases, right, following rule eight, you enclose the truth value, you know, for, for the disjunction, you close the truth value of the disjunction in parentheses, and then you enclose the truth value of the conditional in parentheses. Um, so the, you know, the truth value for the disjunction doesn't change just because we got a disjunction of negations. Uh, the truth value for the conditionals doesn't change just because we got a conditional of negations. Right? Um, but it is going to. But we have we have to use the negations in order to express these other two uh, uh, truth relations. Okay, let's take a look at what contrariety and subcontrariety look like. I'm sorry, contrariety and necessity look like using our rules. So we uh, have rule five. We've got two variables, four rows. We have rule six. We assign every possible combination. Rule seven, where we copy and paste those uh, truth assignments over to the variables. Now, here, here's where things get a little different. Uh, you might think that we need to start enclosing the truth values for the negations. But overall, this uh, proposition is not a negation. Overall, this prop complex proposition is a disjunction. It's a disjunction of negations, but overall, it's still a disjunction. So while we still uh, assign the truth value of negations according to the truth value of the proposition that's you know, negated, right? Uh, overall, we have to follow the truth conditions for a disjunction. Okay, so. Uh, you know, looking at the looking at, looking at this junction here, uh, row one is the only one where both disjuncts are false. So you look at the negations, right? You look at the negations, and each one is false. So that's the only row where the entire disjunction is false. All right. Rows two, right? The, the negation of Q is true. Row three, the negation of P is true, and row four, both negations are true. And so in those rows, two, three, and four, the entire disjunction is true. So uh, we, enclose a, we enclose the truth value of the disjunction within the parentheses. Something similar happens with uh, necessity, where we have a conditional of negations. Okay? So rule five, we have our rows. Rule six, we uh, give our truth assignments. Row seven, we copy and paste those truth assignments to every instance of the variable. Right? We have the same uh, truth assignments. Uh, and now... Again, so the next step, we don't go straight for the conditional, right? Because the conditional uh, is not a conditional of the atomic propositions; it's a conditional of the negations of the atomic propositions. So we have to give our truth values for our negations next, and they're still not enclosed in parentheses because overall, the co the proposition, the complex proposition, is a conditional. So we look through. Um, you could do this a couple of different ways. You can either just take it real fast. So you, find, so you look at the antecedent, and so it's the negation of P is the antecedent, and you can just tick those off as true because that antecedent is false. Then you go to the consequent, um, and you look for those rows where the consequent is true, uh, and negation of Q is true only uh, in row four. Hmm? Only in row four. So uh, row three is the only one where the negation is, or the uh, antecedent is true and the consequent of fa is false. The antecedent of P is true. Uh, excuse me, the antecedent is the negation of P, and that's true. And the consequent is the negation of Q, and that's false. So that's the only one that gets uh, uh, assigned false. Right? That's the only row. The only way for conditional to be false is if the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. And I have this in the text, but I thought I'd just kind of highlight it. This just nicely sums up the truth conditions for our, uh, for our, our, our complex propositions.